Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Ralph Peterson. I'm an ophthalmologist and a specialist in photochemistry. I will be talking about the genetic model and how does it fit in optometry? Well, genetics is being incorporated into medical care in terms of dealing with disease and specifically in one of the really critical areas of pre-symptomatic evaluation or in other words, it's being able to intervene before the symptoms. The advantage of that of course is that you delay the onset of the disease of then when it once manifests you can delay the progression. Hopefully have also decreased the severity and things like that. So this is already being done and interestingly ocular disease represents really a better sort of venue. So to speak than systemic disease because there are a whole bunch of ocular diseases that result from a single mutation. In one codon, lots of these systemic diseases, like heart disease, hypertension, metas and other things. The genetic contribution is very complex. There are multiple genes at multiple sites and there are all sorts of complications and complexities in terms of applying that to actual clinical care, even though it will be done, but it will take a longer period of time. There are all these studies going on like, the Thousand Genomes Project, the genomics is already been applied. In terms of ocular disease. I read a paper where they were looking at mutations in. Sir, if the mutation occurs in that area, it tremendously affects how rhodopsin responds to light. It does. So because the rhodopsin to respond abnormally, and it does result in, disease but it's not quite as drastic as in the first sight. We were able to show this with standard measurements that one will do in a clinical setting, such as visual acuity visual field diameter darker that sensitivity ERG amplitude but it's not something that optometry is identified. There are two categories. The first category is genetic testing useful, in terms of the things that I mentioned, I think the second issue is in terms of optometrists dealing with ocular disease. The public recognizes optometrists as being viable healthcare providers in terms of ocular disease. And I feel, now this entire thing could be in jeopardy, if optometrists don't get involved with genetics, when someone presented with some sort of ocular disease, we already at the five. A point, it's not a, question of, you know. If this happens is a question of when it's going to happen, okay? I have no idea when it's going but it's going to happen. And optometrists are completely unprepared for this. So what does that mean? Let's say, you know some point that's what the ophthalmologists start to do, you know, in other words, you go in for an exam for an ocular disease and they will draw blood and send it out for genetic analysis and optometrists are doing this. So, terms of the public perception. What does that mean? So, in my mind, is sort of analogous to, let's see. You going to your internist for your yearly checkup. And the person not drawing blood to do. Let's say a lipid profile. So who's going to continue to go to such a person? Most of the ophthalmologists are doing genetic testing, and helping patients with that. In fact, I think just about everybody involved in ocular disease in the awful Matagi community, is doing this as part of standard care routine, as I said, there are a few optometrists here and there who are doing bobs is so something that is recognized university in optometry. And more importantly, as I said, we're not training students to get involved in this area in terms of the mundane aspects including insurance. I think there are three things in general, that are happening that are pushing genetic testing on and more into clinical care ocular as well as as otherwise one is that the amount of money, it costs to do, the analysis is coming way down. The second thing is the length of time, it it takes to do an analysis is speeding up very significantly. And, perhaps, most importantly, the insurance companies are starting to cover the tab because they are beginning to realize that it will cost them less in the long run. 
So these are all important issues that are driving genetic testing into a standard medical care. Both nutrition and genetics are becoming part of issues that are important in terms of ocular disease and specifically in age-related macular degeneration. So, one of the things that has happened just over the last couple of years is some models have been set up which look at a bunch of different factors including genetics, environmental diet, nutrition demographic, and ocular factors that can predict how likely it is that someone is going to develop MD. And once it develops, what the likely progression characteristics are going to be. But again, show you how both these areas are becoming vital in terms of dealing with ocular disease, concludes it. Hi, I'm Dr. Han. Philip, first of all, thank you everyone for coming here tonight. Dogs can have a variety of back or spinal diseases and injuries slipped or protruding discs are very well known in longer back breeds of dogs like dark zones, for example, but a disease, you may not have heard of can be very devastating and I have an interesting case to show you. The disease is called Wobbler's Syndrome. Tucker is a three-year-old rescue dog who is very loved by his adoptive family. He is a great day but because he's adopted from a rescue, the family did not know anything about Matthew's medical history Will Brady. D. However, at about eight months, after coming, home Tucker began showing some very subtle signs of lack of coordination and slipping on tile floors, then one evening in normal play, you yelled out with severe pain in his neck. The next day, routine x-rays of the neck reveal, the suspicion of a cervical malformation. In the last three neck vertebrae, he was sent to a specialist in neurology for an exam and even an MRI exactly as we have in human hospitals. It was done under a general anesthetic. The MRI shows very clearly three cervical vertebrae that are thickening and pressing inward on the spinal cord. This is called spinal stenosis and it will call slow progression of weakness and, therefore, the name Wobbler's syndrome and eventually, it will cause paralysis. And unfortunately, early euthanasia, it is an unfortunate and sad disease, seen in many breeds, especially coming in, Doberman, and Great Dane. The first signs are usually seen at four to six years of age and Dobermans but much younger in Great Danes, the owners typically, see their dog become wobbly or uncoordinated. You may hear of cures such as feeding low calcium, diet, and acupuncture but none of these things have been proven to be of real benefit. Some wobble is, dogs, can be managed on steroids and restricted activity, but the only real cure is a spine, surgery called modified dorsal laminectomy. The surgical procedure of the spine which aims to provide access to a prolapsed disc can therefore relieve pressure on the spinal cord. This surgery can take place only once the location of the trouble spot is known. This procedure is also used for dogs with severe neurological damage to the hind limbs bladder or bowel as a result of spinal cord compression. Dr. Larry Newman, a board certified specialist in neurosurgeon in private practice at the veterinary referral center did the surgery on Tucker. An extremely delicate and precise operation. Special instruments are used to remove the tops of the affected vertebrae, which then decompress the spinal cord and allow it to function without the damaging pressure. That will eventually cause pain and paralysis immediately after surgery is important. The dog has strict rest for a period of weeks to allow swelling and inflammation to subside. The dog requires appropriate pain relief. And for those with impaired, limb or bladder or bowel function nursing care is essential to prevent bed sores or urine skull in the India term, physiotherapy such as hydrotherapy. Massage, and passive movement exercises can help to maintain muscle tone and aid recovery. This allows the muscle to reattach to the operative area today, Taco is recovered. In a happy healthy dog, who will live a normal life without worries of pain or paralysis. The cost of diagnostic scans is significant at around $800 to $2,000. The surgical expertise and equipment needed means. This is an expensive procedure and you should expect to pay anywhere between $1,500 and $6,000 each.
Also be borne in mind the dog may need intensive care for a few days following surgery, which cost around $600 per night. Since the Tucky's own is had purchased pet insurance, their company paid 90% of the total cost in is a perfect example of how pet health insurance really pays Tucker's owners call these symptoms early at. It was really helpful for both the veterinarian and a specialist to work together for a perfect outcome. This also demonstrates how early detection of any problem in the help of the whole veterinary care team is so important for the precise treatment and complete cure there is a recognized predisposition to disc disease, such as in the dashing through the owner should avoid activities which place strain on the back. In addition, at the first indication of back pain, the dog should be strictly rested and given pain relief dogs, that show signs of numbness on the back end, such as staggering weakness or poor coordination should be, rested and see a vet as soon as possible in order. We had done three major feeding studies, by feeding studies. I mean studies in which we provide everything that a person eats and drinks for a fairly long period of time. Some of our studies that last up to a half a year to our first study was, tighter approaches, stop hypertension that identify that overall dietary pattern, that was helpful in terms of lowering blood pressure, cardiovascular, risk the diazonium salt and high in fruits vegetables. Actually, it tested attributes of diet other than salt. So, salt was held constant with the diet that was most effective was a diet that was richard, fruits and vegetables, low fat, dairy products, and reducing saturated fat. And we did a second study that did address the issue, you brought up Norman, which is the effects of salt on blood, pressure P. In that we did a dose response study in the lower the sodium intake, the lower the blood pressure and we did a third study where we said. Okay. Well those dyes. As the DASH diet is relatively in high in carbohydrate. But if we reduce some of the carbohydrate, replaced it with protein or unsaturated, fat mostly mono and saturated fat that you would get from the olive oil. For example, looking for the optimal diet to lower blood pressure because blood pressure is such a powerful risk factor for heart disease and stroke the diets that were higher and protein and iron man's atrophy and slightly better production than the original dash diet, but not so much that you would say we should change. Regardless basically said, you know, people reduce their saturated fat. They can replace it with carbohydrate unsaturated fat or protein, which is a good message that gives people flexibility. Then our first study is the Omnicorp study. That was a study to look at the effects of glycemic index on cardiovascular risk factors. And so the idea was to say, okay, people have been espousing. Low glycemic index, diet is helpful, typically in terms of heart disease, what you see our signal. Those related to LDL cholesterol blood pressure, and to our surprise. They really were no major effects of the low glycemic index diets risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So if you are a participant in our study, we have been randomized with sequence of the four different diets. So whenever your own control because you went through all 4.5. So you could compare your effects on one, died, two effects on the other side. So here are the four diets. One is high carbohydrate high glycemic index that what we said was our sort of controlled. I meant high carbohydrate low. Glycemic index. Those are carbohydrates that take a bit more time to get into the bloodstream and video. Avoid large fluctuations. Then the third diet was low, carbohydrate high glycemic index in the fourth. And, the one that we thought would be the best would be low carbohydrate low glycemic index. Okay, so we are really interested in the control versus that one, each of those dies. By the way, we're fed for five weeks, April. Consume all five weeks of a diet and then we measured very rigorously the risk. Factors lipids, blood pressure, measured insulin resistance, as well, and did not see any benefit, 
from the diet. That was low in glycemic index wasn't a bit of harm from one of the times I was agnostic on this one. I wasn't quite sure what the direction of the results would go, but I thought that if anything, there would be a signal of benefit. Actually, there was a bit of a signal of harm. The dice have had the low glycemic index LDL cholesterol seem to go up. Just a form of cholesterol that is, considered bad price. I talk to you is that the catch of his of food around with low glycemic index and may well be the fiber in them. That's the issue. Not the here. See this is a common issue with studies of diet or fruit or nutrients is that neutral color and isolation. There was a called confounding nutrients travel together. So typically most foods that are high in the glycemic index or low in fiber and foods that are low or glycemic tend to be iron fiber, sort of like, the, the white rice versus brown rice whole grain. So that's where we sort of think. This is going. I said, you can get the benefits that we attributed to low glycemic by focusing more, on other aspects of diet, moving on to obesity, wishing our researches. You try behavioral change of tried, feeding dogs. And so on. How, would you sum up a state of the art from your research in terms of what you find doing? Feeding studies is one of my favorite forms of research because the you get clean answers are participants real world. It's not the real world. But it tells you what would happen. If you. So this time what you get with behavioral intervention? Studies, is well. Can you in the real world follow a diet? And so, individuals have to deal with all of the things that you and I deal with, you fund your research behavioral interventions, which you promised me, I have done a fair amount of work on helping people who are overweight or obese, try to control their way. And you do get some benefit from various behavioral interventions such as what we typically try to get individuals to do is to first of all, know, where their calories come from. So they actually do. What about food, records? Have some individuals that might be strippers, sweetened beverages of the people might be large portion sizes. Other people might be frequently being across the day and then what you is working with the counselor to identify types of foods episodes of calorie consumption where you can pull back where you can make, substitutes and do things that are feasible. The challenge is that in order to lose weight, you have to have pretty big calorie deficit. So people typically say in order to lose about a pound every other week, you need to reduce your calorie intake by 500 calories per day, dude, that you really need to track your way, track your calories. And so we actually, in most of our interventions now tools, to help people self-monitor. The other thing that we do is we try to have some type of continued intervention because weight loss interventions are not just something that just sort of you give it, and it's over. It really requires some efficient way to sort of continue it with fairly frequent contact with doing it efficiently. So, instead of having a person, either meet you or call you, you have, some sort of inexpensive approach to art of keep you engaged over time, which we think is really important and very quickly, a huge problem in Australia, which is damage to your kidneys usually affect your health. Yeah, that's another area of my interest. So, I try to look for interventions that are modifiable and so I've been interested in diet, physical activity, with kidney disease. It's probably a mixture of modifiable as well as genetic you accumulate this aging but ac is the smarter, you know, disease it's it's all sorts of things. Accumulate could be damaged as you get older, and increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes. Aging is represents the cumulative burden of exposures or bad things that have happened to us over time. So if we consume foods that damage in our arteries our kids, he's over time, that will progress now. Now, I don't want to dismiss the effects of diet. There been other investigators who have focused on diets rich in fruits and vegetables and there might be a benefit and triple acid base balance vera, providing some would call bicarbonate which is a base that actually helps to preserve kidney function as early evidence. I think there's a good signal there.
but there's something going on. I can tell you that just in this community around Popkins, very high prevalence of chronic kidney disease proteinuria, which is a manifestation of kidney disease. And many of us think that it's something about the environment. And I personally think it's an advertising diet. I was reading the number of respectable liver cancers has actually grown. By 115% in the past decade. Why are we seeing some of these numbers rise when it comes to liver cancer? So we were cancer or cancer that starts in the liver is really caused. Patients who have liver cancer have underlying liver disease or cirrhosis of the liver scar tissue in the liver. And we're seeing more patients with fatty liver causing cirrhosis and an increase in liver cancer because of that. And then also still seeing a lot of patients with hepatitis C developing liver cancer, even though we've got great treatments for that virus as well. So, a lot of times people connect to liver disease with people who drink excessive amounts of alcohol, but as you're saying hey, after hearing Willingham in more people that maybe aren't the abusive of alcohol. Absolutely, alcohol isn't even the most common cause for cirrhosis. The most common reasons. The really is fatty liver, which is associated with diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity and in the metabolic problems that we're seeing on the rise as well. And then viral hepatitis is the second most common. Wow, so we were talking about treatments of liver disease, liver cancer. There's really not too many options out there. What it what are we looking at? As far as as new treatments and treatments that have been shown to be somewhat successful? Yeah? So when we're thinking about liver cancer, as I said, most of the most people have underlying liver disease, so where cancer is a little different than other cancers because we have to think about the underlying liver problems in addition to thinking chair, itself, which is why a lot of liver cancer treated by liver doctors and not necessarily cancer. Doctors. The time the best treatments are surgical either cutting it out or doing a liver transplant, but unfortunately most patients by 80% of patients aren't diagnosed in time to get that surgical treatment and that's when we really are talking about the unresectable or inoperable liver cancers where we're now thinking about the new treatments that we have available and I would imagine as we see with other cancers. The reason it's being diagnosed so late is because the symptoms are kind of all over the place. So let's talk about the symptoms and yeah, so liver disease really doesn't cause a lot of symptoms until it's advanced and this is part of the problem with diagnosing liver disease and diagnosing liver cancer. As I say, to my patients, the liver is a very forgiving organ. So it has to go through a lot of damage before it actually causes symptoms and that might be things like tiredness pitching, yellow eyes swelling in the legs, swelling or water, build up in the abdomen and confusion and not thinking clearly those are some of the advanced symptoms has that we see but when it's early liver disease we really don't see a lot of symptoms at all liver cancer is the same way so if you think about the liver it's about the size of a football we want to find a cancer when it's the size of a golf ball and you can hide a lot of golf balls inside of a football without having any symptoms at all. So, when somebody has liver, it's important that we actually do screening for liver cancer and we check them, every six months with lab tests and imaging tests the ultrasound or a CAT scan or an MRI so that we can find these cancers when they're early. How who's a good candidate for doing a screening before? There are any symptoms? Maybe you have a history of it in your family. Maybe, you know, that you haven't been exactly great about your alcohol use, or or poking other risk factors. Can you walk into, your doctor and say, hey, mate for my liver function? Absolutely. So liver function. Screening is really just a lab test. If there's an easy lab panel that we can get and primary care, doctors often do it but not always as part of the yearly physical. But if you have risk factors for liver disease, it is important to know what your liver panel looks like. And know whether you have liver problems, or not. Okay, and are there different ways to diagnose? What there might be if the liver function tests? 
just so somebody have elevated liver function tests in the next step is we do a whole panel of labs to try to diagnose why they have those liver camp liver function problems. Because there's a lot of things that can affect the liver. We also see sometimes where people can just have one time elevations of liver tests and and it goes back to normal and that doesn't mean anything as long as if it's just one time elevated, unless you also have risk factors. So again, that forgiving organ and really liver cancer, even though we've seen these numbers kind of skyrocket. It doesn't seem to get the attention that some of the other cancers do. Why do you think that is? So I think. So, we were, cancer right now is actually the fifth most common cause of cancer-related deaths. And it's actually the only one of the few cancer deaths. It's actually increasing in incidence and frequency as compared to decreasing most cancer. Deaths are actually going down and never problems. As you sound, oftentimes are associated with alcohol.